All right, so uh, Ken Milne, I'm going to be talking about thrombolysis uh, in the, um, uh, for stroke, but really this lecture is supposed to be focused on thrombolysis as a bridging therapy or as a facilitating therapy for EVT, endovascular therapy for stroke. But to get into that um, literature, I get to talk a little bit, a lot, about where did we get, or how did we get here to thrombolysis in stroke in general? And is there new information about just using thrombolysis for stroke? Because very few people really qualify for endovascular therapy, and we'll get into that literature where it says, you know, it's not a huge number, it's an effective therapy, but it's not a huge number who qualify. For, for most of us, it's gonna be thrombolytics for acute ischemic stroke, right? We've got code strokes in our facilities, and that is what we're um, usually doing. And so I'm gonna go through some of that literature, and there's some really interesting stuff that's come up in the last couple of years on thrombolytics for stroke. So uh, the, the lecture starts with, could there be a more controversial topic than thrombolytics and stroke? I started, well, I, I finished and, and started practice in 1997. NINS was published in 1995. So it's been 27 years since the first study that had its primary outcome that showed superiority over placebo for stroke, 27 years. So if you've practiced long enough, you've seen this unroll. So let's take a look at some of the recent literature. So abstract number one, this is the wake up trial and a whole bunch of wake up trials like when patients, we didn't know when their last time seen well was because you know, it was sometime the night before and the stroke could have happened five minutes after they fell asleep or five minutes before they woke up. So this was the wake-up trial, 2018, randomized control trial, looking at strokes of unknown onset of or, uh, time, and they did advanced imaging, right? They had advanced imaging with a 24-hour neurologist who was really happy to talk to you at any time. That's sarcasm, by the way. Yeah, I'm calling it two o'clock. They love, especially the neurosurgeons, but the neurologists. So you're calling, you know, 24 seven, they've got a neurologist, they've got the radiologist who's gonna read it quickly, and they've got an MRI 24 seven to do this. Does anybody have access to MRI 24 seven for this? So we're talking about a, a, a narrow group, right? And these patients would be whisked away and, uh, and they'd be uh, treated very quickly if the advanced imaging showed the image was consistent with a stroke that happened within four and a half hours, because they're gonna be thrombolysing them, right? And it's FDA approved, uh, Alteplase is FDA approved for under three hours, but people are using it up to four and a half hours, right? So, um, so they did this, they were able to randomize 1.6 patients per year, per year in this study. Okay, it was stopped early. They got about 500 patients into the trial. They were looking for 800 because they ran out of funding. Do you think the makers of Alteplase are hurting for funding? They ran out of funding. Now they did find an 11% benefit, a superiority, a favorable neurologic outcome. And they defined that as a modified Rankin score of zero to one. That's important because you watch how they move that goalpost around. So for this one, it was a good neurologic outcome, zero to one, 90 days, 11% benefit, favorable neural outcome. And they give you the p-value of 0 0.02 for what that's worth. But they also found a 3% increase in death. They stopped the trial early. Now the p-value for that was 0 0.05, and this is some arbitrary number, right? 0.05, if you're on one side, you spike the ball, you high five, you're getting published, and I'm being a little facetious, and if you're on the other side of 0.05, you're not getting published, it's in the bottom of the drawer, and you feel great shame and continue to work on something else, right? That's called publication bias. Now, I'm overstating that, but they stopped the trial at this arbitrary, um, or we have this arbitrary number of 0.05. Um, so, you know, technically you can say no statistical difference in death. But if you looked at death or dependence, a modified Rankin score of five, which is, you know, in a long-term care facility, advanced nursing skilled facility and stuff like that, or death, there was, there was no 
difference with thrombolytics. It didn't have any benefit towards that. So advocates, of course, would suggest that, hey, look, you know, even though we stopped early, and when we stop trials early for benefit, it tends to overestimate the point estimate of benefit. And uh, so they'll say, this is good, and there was no increase in harm. Now, critics or skeptics like me would say, hey, you know what? I'm more interested in poo, a patient-oriented outcome. And what does the patient care about? Um, I think they really care about you know, these objective measures and can they function? Are they having a good neurologic function? And so I'm, I'm pretty good at objectively defining death. Like, have you ever been called to pronounce someone? Yeah, I'm pretty good at, yeah, they're dead. You know, that's very objective as opposed to, I don't know, are they a modified rank and score of four? Do you think they're a three? It's subjective, right? And sometimes these outcomes are done by the patients themselves in unblinded trials. So they know what treatment they got. And so I'm more confident in the mortality, even though the p-value is a little on the wrong side, and less confident in the potential benefit from this wake-up trial. All right, so abstract number two is another trial looking at these wake-up strokes. This was called the EXTEND trial, published in 2019. And it attempts uh, to look at you know, the promise that can we use a CT or MRI perfusion image to identify people who may benefit beyond four and a half hours? Can we extend that window up to nine hours for these individuals? Large multinational trial. And they looked at alteplase versus placebo. About two-thirds of these people had wake-up strokes, so similar to the previous one, but some of them actually had onsets of time that you could define, but they were after four and a half hours, so extending that window to see if there was benefit. This trial was stopped early as well. It was stopped early because they said, hey, look at wake-up. Wake-up showed a benefit of 11%. It would be unethical to continue this trial because there's no longer equipoise. I think that's very unfortunate because replication of studies is always very important. And when you stop trials early for benefit, that was planned by the way, you know, just take it when it comes as comedy. But um, when they stop trials early, it tends to overestimate the benefit because there's something called a regression to the mean, right? Data is noisy, it bounces above and below that point estimate. So I think they made an unfortunate choice, and it's very frustrating for individuals like me who want to interpret the data. It makes it very fuzzy. Um, they claim a benefit in the trial, modified rank and score of 0 to 1, and uh, the p-value was based uh, 0 0.04, okay, when they stopped early. It turns out that that 0 0.04 was only found when they adjusted the data on a post hoc analysis that they didn't pre-plan a priori to say that's how we'll adjust the data. Anybody else's skeptical radar going off? I smell something. Oh, well, anyways. So the, the raw comparison, unadjusted data, the p-value is 0.35. And I don't like to dichotomize on p-values, but it just shows you how you can change around the data and the interpretation. When they did the adjusted sample suggested by the authors themselves, the p-value actually was not statistically significant. It was 0.06. So anyways, it just makes me more skeptical about this. But all these statistical, I don't know what you want to call them, shenanigans or something like that, manipulations, um, it raised a bit of a brouhaha when people were critically appraising these studies. Um, but it turns out the trial was done in 28 centers across Asia, Europe, Australia. And guess how many patients they enrolled per year? One. So we're talking a very narrow window of patients that could benefit from this treatment. Now, I don't know what your healthcare system is undergoing in the US right now. I can tell you in Canada, we are probably not going to be able to put the resources together 24-7, 365 with perfusion imaging, MRIs, radiology, neurology, and everything in place to treat one patient a year. And remember, the number needed to treat isn't one. Right? That's to capture one patient to be treated, even in the best scenario, looking at um, thrombolysis for stroke. If you say 1 in 10, then you're talking about 0.1 patients would benefit with an improved modified Rankin score of 0 to 1 in 90 days. 0.1 one patient a year. All right, well, when you look at EXTEND, 
80% of those patients had large vessel occlusions. What are we doing with large vessel occlusions now? We're getting those to EVT because they have a much more robust data to support that as a beneficial treatment. Third study, this is abstract number three. This was the THAWS study, and it was published in 2020, a large trial, a wake-up trial, strokes of unknown onset, perfusion imaging. The little thing in there that maybe not be highlighted enough is they use a lower dose. They use 0.6 milligrams per kilogram instead of 0.9 because of issues with their population in uh, Japan. Anyways, the trial was stopped early. Surprise. 131 patients. And again, they stopped it because of the wake-up trial results. Um, but first of all, the strokes that were small vessel occlusions rather than LVOs, those strokes didn't benefit, right? And so there wasn't a hint of benefit in this trial if you didn't have an LVO stroke. Because remember, LVOs were sending off to EVT. So to round out this whole little section, abstract number four, um, a meta-analysis. And you have to be careful with meta-analyses because of the GIGO phenomenon, garbage in, garbage out, right? So it depends on the ingredients that you put into this meta-analysis, whether or not you get good outcome into the meat grinder or the sausage grinder. And so they put in wake up, extend, thaws, and one other trial called ECAS-4. They all used high-tech imaging. The interesting thing about this one is they got individual patient data. And when you're doing a meta-analysis, this is really helpful to have the individual patient data because you can do some stuff with subgroups, right? You can really narrow down and focus in on those subgroups. Um, and what they found was there was an 8% favorable outcome, an 8% improvement, a good neurologic outcome, 8%, but a 3% increase in mortality. So an 8% of a subjective eh, fuzzy and a hard outcome of 3% increased mortality. But when you look at this study, and this is why it was important to have the individual patient data, reading the subgroup analysis, there was no statistical difference between the subgroups if you had a non-large vessel occlusion. So if you had a small vessel occlusion, thrombolytics didn't work or weren't demonstrated to show superiority. So most of the trials were done before EVT became generally available and then over time EVT became more generally available and this is one of the reasons they may not have been able to recruit and recruitment was so low because by the time the studies were into it, they were like, oh, this is an LVO. We're not going to randomize them into this trial. We're just going to send them for LVO because we've got better data that shows EVT for LVOs is better. All right. All right, moving on from that thorny issue. Um, abstract number five. This is uh, put down in your manual as a rare gem because we haven't had a replication of NINs, right? 1995, about 300 patients, 13% absolute benefit, modified Rankin score of zero to two at 90 days, never replicated, never replicated. It was the first and only study that showed a benefit with thrombolytics for their primary outcome. No other study has ever shown that. And so in 2018, this was published, and what they said was, can we expand the use of thrombolytics for very mild strokes, an NIHS score of five or under, so less than six, the minor strokes, right? Can we just clear out the pipes, just finish off, you know, just flush them out, right, and help these patients? And so they did it in under three hours, and they compared alteplase to aspirin. Um, now, some places were already doing this, you know, in under, under uh, an NIHS score of six. So this was something that was happening within the community, so they did an RCT to check. It was stopped early due to lack of funding. These guys have big, or these people have big pockets, right? They stopped this trial, so that always makes me like, hmm, really? They would planned on almost 1,000 patients, they got 313, so they got about a third of the patients. NINs had about 300 patients, so now we have another trial that was stopped early that has about 300 patients. It is probably the largest and most rigorous trial looking at that zero to three hour time window. <sighs> Guess what they found? No superiority to thrombolytics in these mild strokes. 26% hmm. of the lytic group 
versus 13%. So let me do the math, carry the one. Okay, that's 13% difference experienced a serious adverse event if they got thrombolytics. And so this led to the first time the AHA, the American Heart Association, pulled back and said, whoa, don't be giving this to mild strokes. Don't be giving, if you've got an NIHSS score of less than six, do not thrombolyze those patients. Anybody still working in a center where they're doing this? Because I've seen it, I've seen it happen. All right, so abstract number six was probably the biggest and most sort of shake the ground in the stroke literature, you can see I'm passionate about this, was Brian Alper's paper. And Brian Alper and colleagues reanalyzed ECAS-3. To remind you, ECAS-3 is the only trial that showed a benefit of thrombolytics in the three to four and a half hour window. So we've got NINs, zero to three hours, ECAS-3, three to four and a half hours, about 800 patients. Those are the only two trials out of, let's say, 13 foundational trials on thrombolytics in general, or 26 trials, if you look at you know, a much broader uh, look at the literature, um, that claim benefit. So we've got two positive trials, and the rest didn't show benefit for their primary outcome. So ECAS-3, and so what Brian uh, and his group did was they lobbied to get the data, to get the individual patient data, to try to get the data from the authors. And they had to fight for this. They finally got the data and they reanalyzed it um, looking at that. And they wanted to control for some imbalances. And with randomization, sometimes you get imbalances. And in this case, they had more people with a history of stroke in the placebo group and more people with a higher NA. NIHSS score, so they were sicker in the placebo group. And one of the best predictors of how you're going to do in stroke is how bad you were when you came in with your stroke, right? A really bad stroke usually leads to bad outcomes. A mild stroke leads to milder outcomes, better outcomes, right? And so they thought that there were some imbalances, so they wanted to adjust and control for those. So they got the data, and first they found no benefit in any outcome when they ran the data. No benefit. Now, originally, the authors claim a 6% absolute benefit at 90 days. Um, using standard adjustments for group imbalances, they found no benefit, no superiority. Second, they attempted to replicate the original author's adjusted analysis, you know, because you adjust for imbalances, and they used the author's methodology, and they found no difference, no, no superiority, no statistical benefit. Wow. And so the authors use some very gentle scientific language. If you've ever read some of these, it's like, we suggest, you know, like, and you go, ooh, that's a mic drop. Boom. Right? They said, previously reported adjusted analysis suggesting efficacy shows statistical significance only under multiple conditions that do not represent the most informative use of the data. Seven other less selective approaches to these adjusted analysis fail to replicate significant effects. If you're a nerd like me, that's like, whoa, boom. So, um, so Alper and colleagues challenged policymakers, clinicians, um, to reassess the use of Alteplase in three to four and a half hours. And that's what uh, Rick asked me to say what I'm doing in my country. I've approached our national organization that's called CAPE. You have ASAP, we have CAPE, Canadian Association of Emergency Physicians. I serve on their stroke committee, and uh, when I was doing that, um, I asked them if they would uh, re, re look at this issue of giving thrombolytics from three to four and a half hours because of Brian Alper's paper, because we don't have a paper that shows benefit in that randomized um, group. Um, and that's been passed off to an organization called CADETH, which is an independent organization with no financial ties to anything, and they're doing that right now, and we hope to have a report out by the end of March. Mm. I also called up Mike Brown. Mike Brown wrote the ASAP clinical policy um, in 2015 that for zero to three hours should offer and may give, but in the three to four and a half hours, it was may offer thrombolytics and may give. So I called up Mike Brown and said, hey, did you see Brian Alper's paper? And he's like, yeah. And I said, you know, we should update the Cochrane Review because he's now in charge of the Cochrane Emergency Medicine section that was just formed. And he was like, hmm. We haven't done an update since 2013, so guess what? There's going to be a new Cochrane systematic review on this coming out, authored by Mike Brown uh, in the near future, in 2022. So, 
And of course, that's when my uh, screen goes dead because I'm already talking too long about stroke. What a surprise. All right, got past Alper. Yep. This gets into, oh geez. There's two publications in 2019 and one in 2021 that summarized some of the, these issues on a website. Anybody familiar with the website, The Number Needed to Treat, the NNT.com? If you're not, it's a great website. And I have a bias because I wrote one of these articles. Now, the 2019 article was written by a Canadian group led by Dr. Eddie Lang out in uh, Calgary. And they came out with a very pro look at this issue of thrombolytics and stroke. And when, uh, when they did this, they used a systematic review by Emerson, who only combined the TPA data. They didn't look at any other thrombolytic. They said, no, since this is the only one that's approved, we should only look at this one. And they came out saying, hey, look at the number needed to treat in under three hours is looking pretty good at 10. And if you look at the number needed to treat from three to four and a half hours, the number needed to treat are 20, and the harm is like 71. And so we would recommend this. We would give this a green light, go. That caught my attention and my colleague, Dr. Justin Morgenstern, who's a friend of mine. And we said, really? There's no real new data here. Um, what's going on? So we looked at it and we used another systematic review and meta-analysis by Donaldson et al. And Donaldson said, you know what? We're only looking, only looking at um, TPA is sort of like the sharpshooter fallacy. We have no good data suggesting one thrombolytic is better than another for efficacy, for clot dissolving. You can talk about allergic reactions with streptokinase, you can talk about bleed rates with other drugs, but when you look at just dissolving the clot, when you look at the STEMI literature that has tens of thousands of patients, there wasn't a difference between how well these thrombolytics, oh, one has to be infused and one has to be bolus and you know, those types of things, right? But not patient-oriented outcome. So we're kind of doing a Texas sharpshooter fallacy or we're cherry-picking the data. Why don't we look at all the data and wouldn't that be a more inclusive way to do it? I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. I'm just saying we took this approach um, when we looked at the data. And so 26 trials looked at it and we said, you know what? There's just not enough data. We're uncertain. And so ours was, we don't know. Our conclusion was, eh, we're not convinced. We're uncertain if there is a benefit here. There may be, we were optimistic, because now if you, if you take out the LVOs, maybe just look at those people with advanced imaging that may have some good collateral flow, that maybe thrombolytics will work, may work. Super, demonstrate it in a properly done trial, and then we'll accept that. All right, bottom line. Some new data finds no advantage for thrombolytics. Um, old data on closer review, like ECAS-3 that was reevaluated by Brian Alper, actually never showed superiority. And then meta-analyses, it depends, right? What do you include, what do you exclude in your meta-analysis, and how do you interpret the data? And so I'm a, I'm a shoulder shrugger. I'm, I'm not con, I'm not against. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm uncertain, I'm not sure. All right, so this gets us into, does thrombolytics improve outcomes in patients undergoing EVT? Yes, no, oh geez, I don't know. Another uncertainty. So let's take a look. So we've been bridging. I assume you guys have been bridging. You know, somebody qualifies for EVT, but they want to preload and give them the thrombolytics first, flush things out, or you're transferring from one center to another center. It's like give it, sh drip and ship, or ship, drip and ship, yeah. Drip and ship them out. So um, here is some of the uh, data on that. So thrombolysis before EVT could occasionally avert the need for EVT. Oh, they've recovered, right? So that was one thought of giving it. You can uh, dissolve downstream microemboli that may be created by doing the extraction itself and you know, give it the one-two punch and these people will do better. And so some trials that came out, and there was four major trials that came, on, came out looking at this. There was the Extend IA, Direct MT, Devit, and Skip. So the Extend IA trial used TNK. It wasn't using TPA, but it was the first trial that looked at, or sorry, it was a trial that looked at full dose versus half dose. Okay, full dose versus half dose with EVT. And they found that it really didn't make a difference. 
whether you use the full dose or the half dose. So that suggests, well, if there's not a dose response, maybe there's not a response at all. So that was sort of the nudge there. Abstract, uh, the next abstract is the direct MT, and it was EVT with or without thrombolysis, and it was done in China, and it was given within four and a half hours of stroke. It was a non-inferiority trial, so you're just trying to figure out, is this not any worse? If we don't give it, is it any worse? It's a bit different of a trial design. And they found that giving, or sorry, not giving uh, the thrombolytic prior to EVT was not, was found to be non-inferior. Okay, you gotta watch these double negatives, non-inferior. So early 2021, Devitt and Skip came out. One was from China, one was from Japan. And they looked, um, uh, even better for EVT alone. So EVT alone, and remember, if you're giving more thrombolytics, the increased chance of harm goes up, right? On that teeter-totter of benefit versus harm. Um, but the trials were small, um, and they were trying to establish non-inferiority. One did, one didn't. Um, it's tough, right? When you're trying to something, show something that is not worse than what you're already doing with these non-inferiority study designs. And remember in Japan they use a smaller dose and so people criticize that and say, well, you're only using 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, not the 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. But then you go back to the TNK data and go half dose didn't make a difference. Well, but that's a different molecule. So you see how it gets messy and fuzzy when it comes to looking at this. Other, patient, um, other reviewers said, well, you know, the Asian population is different. What about the European studies and the European populations? I think, I think it's just a big jumbled mess. You know, the first three major trials firmly agreed in Asian countries, EVT alone was effective. It wasn't worse. All the endpoints, right, for all the endpoints is adding thrombolysis, right? And then this fourth trial, abstract number 11, muddied the waters. And this is the European one, um, Devitt trial. Uh, they planned to have 970 patients. They only got 234 enrolled. It was stopped due to efficacy. Again, when you stop trials due to efficacy, it tends to overestimate the benefit. But an interim analysis of a modified Rankin score of zero to two, 54% did well versus 47. So a 7% absolute difference. So they stopped the trial early and non-inferiority was uh, declared. Uh, in the Japan base, the skip trial, yeah, that was the uh, one where they used the smaller dose. Abstract uh, number 13 is the Mr. Clean No IV, 20 centers in Europe, came to a slightly more, and a slightly more confusing uh, conclusion. EVT was neither superior nor non-inferior. Oh, thanks. You really helped me there. You know, so it wasn't better and it wasn't worse. Oh, you mean it was pretty much the same? Okay, thanks. Um, anyways, and there was no statistical difference for any of the um, primary or secondary outcomes between groups. Uh, so finally, to help elucidate, oh, there's some editorials, leading authorities, holding fast to thrombolis thrombolytics, that's abstract number 14, and they make some several points about, well, you know, the European studies versus the Asian studies, and I hope I've confused you because that's the data, it's confusing, um, but the bottom line is adding um, thrombolytics to EVTs in Asia, probably, clearly, we don't have good evidence that it's helpful, it's probably unhelpful, and in Western countries, in Europe, um, we don't know. And in fact, the guidelines came out uh, for Europe uh, about a month ago uh, in February saying, we still recommend you, you, you pre-treat um, with thrombolytics prior to EVT. So to wrap this up, key points and recommendations. We have four trials extending the window for thrombolytics to wake up strokes, yielding some favorable outcomes, but also increased mortality. I think you need to discuss that with patients, right? There might be an increase in potential benefit, but also an increase in potential harm. It appears that most of this benefit is among patients with the LVO strokes, but those patients are gonna get EVT. Patients with minor strokes, an NIHS score of zero to five, the AHA has pulled back and said, don't be thrombolysing those. Um, ECAS-3 has been reanalyzed and failed to show superiority. The benefits of thrombolysis for stroke remain strongly supported by some, and some of us remain skeptical. Doesn't mean I claim it doesn't work, it's just I'm just not convinced that it does. And that's an important distinction in epistemology. 
EVTs for large vessel occlusions, I think it is a proven intervention, I'm convinced, for anterior circulation strokes, and we're gonna talk about posterior circulation strokes tomorrow, so stay tuned. Um, and those three trials in Asian populations suggest that adding thrombolytics does not improve outcomes if they're going for EVT, and a recent trial in Europe showed no benefit but couldn't show non-inferiority. So shouldn't co didn't show superiority, but also didn't show non-inferiority. So I hope that's completely confused you on what to do. Yes? So I've got to give a shout out to Jerry Hoffman. Oh, yeah. I've been coming in for 20 years. 20 years ago, he said the same thing. He was on the panel evaluating CPX for a bit of a walk panel. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if people can hear, but we're, we're giving a shout out to Dr. Jerome Hoffman, who's my mentor. You know, I, I you know, learned from him uh, uh, a lot about this literature, and he was serving on a panel that looked at this 20, 25 years ago, was sort of, you know, with regards to his contribution. Um, but I think his contribution to how emergency medicine uh, practitioners think and evaluate the literature is invaluable. And it speaks to knowledge translation. Here we are. 27 years after NINS was published, still talking about this trial. And you know what would solve it? Replicating it, or attempting to replicate it, right? That, we could put much of this to rest, right? Um, and knowledge translation typically takes 17 years for 14% of the information to reach the patient's bedside. So while it's disheartening, it's also not surprising that I'm still here and I'm standing here in 2022, standing on his shoulders, what he was saying in the late 90s. Thank you.